This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Jonathan Bennett and I join Ben Metters and Garth Vanderhoen of Meshtastic. Meshtastic is off the grid mesh networking. It's a new thing. It's a hot thing. It's used in all kinds of ways all over the world. You ought to be interested in this because it's really interesting stuff. <laughs> I, I knew nothing about it before we started and now I'm learning so much and I all came during this show and you should see it coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 730, recorded Wednesday, May 3rd, 2023, going off the grid with Meshtastic. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. Collide is a device trust solution that ensures that if a device isn't secure, it can't access your apps. It's zero trust for Okta. Visit collide.com slash floss and book a demo today. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. Greetings, everyone, everywhere. I am Doc Searles. You're not, but that's a good thing. Um, I am joined this week by Jonathan Bennett himself from hey, 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 hey. of Oklahoma, somewhere where he lost power last night. Yeah, we did. It was uh, it was interesting. We're sitting, I was sitting out here in the office with the windows open because it was nice. And all of a sudden, boom, <laughs> the battery backup started beeping. It's like, oh, well, this is going to be an interesting evening. They're out there working now. So if I suddenly disappear in the middle of the show, that's maybe what happened. <laughs> no, I hope not. Um, they When it went boom, is it like like a, a transformer exploded or something like that? Well, that's Better. that's what I figured it would be. But, you know, I kind of watched over, you know, I went out, out back and watched over the fence as the guy was out there walking around. And it seems like maybe it was just an underground line shorted out uh, because there wasn't evidence of a transformer explosion. So I don't know. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not a high voltage electrician, though. So I'm. Just, yeah. I I, all I know is that they used to be anyway filled with PCBs, which is like this really horrible stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't want outside of a transformer <laughs> anyway so i i'm i'm in temporarily again for the several several time uh in a friend's house in los angeles um and are are you uh are you up on, on mishtastic our the topic today and our a, a bit so i actually did the reach out and invited the guys here uh over their discord which i've, I've actually found to be a great way to get a hold of devs um <laughs> But no, Meshtastic, in fact, I've got a, I've got a device here. Uh, the Rack Wireless makes a kit to get started. And I'm trying to remember, somebody was asking me about how to do, and we'll get into this during the show, actually, because it's a neat story, um, about how to do mesh for um, you know certain situations where maybe the cellular grid is going to get turned off. And so I started doing some looking, and I came across Meshtastic and this device, and the price was low enough. You know, there's this, there's this boundary. It's like, if I got to spend over a hundred or over $200 on something, it's like, man, I just can't do that on the whim. But if it's only like $40 a piece and it sounds cool enough, I'll just go <laughs> for it on a whim and hope it works out. And so this, the, this project, the hardware is just below that threshold. So I went for it and it actually looks pretty cool for doing, uh, you know, meshing off grid, uh, communications, which especially in places like Oklahoma, where we have power outages and tornadoes and all kinds of fun stuff like that. Every once in a while could come in handy. So that was, the, that was earthquakes too. We have very small earthquakes. <laughs> you know, we had, we had back a few years ago, the largest earthquake that was ever recorded in Oklahoma. And the damage was that one chimney somewhere out in the middle of nowhere fell over. And the meme <laughs> was, you know, two lawn chairs, one of them fallen over. We will rebuild. It was not a serious earthquake. Uh, I'm, I, I am where, like right over there, uh, down that hill is the, uh, the Rogers Fault. Um, Rogers, yeah, in, in Los Angeles, where under, the, under that hillside, the Strait of Rock underneath there displaced 17,000 feet. <laughs> and, and there's a, 
There are mountains over here, up to almost 12,000 feet high. Just showed up in the geologic yesterday, so it's a little <laughs> more, a little more active. So um, uh, our, our, our guests today are from Meshtas, that we just said. I'll just introduce them now. We have Ben Metters. Um, he's a full-stack C-sharp developer, does .NET, Vue.js, software engineer by day, device firmware developer on Meshtastic, among other projects at night. Uh, he's a tinkerer, does IoT, uh, the outdoors, all kinds of stuff. Um, and Garth Vanderhoen, he's a senior software engineer at a fintech company, not being named, in Seattle, <laughs> and a lead developer on the Meshtastic iOS and Mac application. So welcome, guys. Are you both, I, I already know Ben's in Arkansas somewhere, and Garth, are you actually in Seattle or are you somewhere else? Uh, yeah, I'm in a suburb of Seattle. So, but which one? Bellevue. Okay, cool. I Linux Journal, which where I spent uh, 24 years, uh, was for most of its life in the Ballard District of uh, Seattle, which I loved, loved yeah. going to. Right. So, so tell us, uh, tell us about Mishtastic and what brought you guys together. What, what's the what's the big cause here? Um. So the history a little bit is uh, a developer at Google named Kevin Hester. Um, he initially found the T-Beam, which is a device that kind of has uh, a bunch of different components all in one package. So it's got a, a Tesla battery and a GPS chip and the microcontroller and an OLED screen all in one device with the ESP32. Yeah, Ben's holding one up there. <laughs> um, and when that came out, that was kind of a neat, uh, you know, where you didn't have to cobble together four or five sensors to have a kind of complete handheld device. And, and his use case originally was uh, paragliding and hiking, I believe. Um, and for a long time, for a year, he wrote uh, the firmware, the Android app and uh, Python application. Um, and kind of released them and people tested and, and created some new features and stuff. And uh, Ben and I got involved after a little less than a year after the project started. Um, and Kevin had some back issues that prevent him from being able to code super effectively for long periods of time. So he's able to uh, retire pretty happily, but he's not able to code much anymore. So a lot of what Ben and I worked on in the first year was just kind of figuring out how to replace a initial benevolent dictator of an open source project and kind of spread um, what one person was doing in three different apps into a bunch of, you know, we now have a web application. I wrote the, the iOS Apple apps. Um, we have uh, students at Dartmouth that are working on a Rust application for search and rescue. So there's a whole bunch of different clients. We have our Android developers in Brazil. We have firmware developers in Germany. So um, that's been, that's kind of our recent story has been replacing a really, a really uh, impressive developer that was kind of doing everything. And now we have kind of a host of us doing little pieces at a time. So. Oh, ben, I want to ask you if uh, the back issues had to do with paragliding. Did I hear that right? I'm not entirely sure of the nature of of where his his back issue started, but I, I know uh, I know a lot of it uh, was exacerbated by sitting in a chair right all day and 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 you know banging away at code. So so it wasn't um, your back issues. It was a no. Oh, no, I see. No, it was Kevin. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay, I was wondering where you go paragliding in in Arkansas, but uh, <laughs> uh, not not very far. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, ben, why don't, why don't you take it from there and tell us kind of what part of the project you do? And if there's any, I don't know, sort of pitfalls about taking over from a benevolent dictator, because that, that seems that strikes me as something that a lot of projects are going to have to do at some point or another. Uh, so I'm curious more about that, but also Ben, kind of what your your hand is in the project. Yeah, so I, I kind of um, ha took on the role. I guess it was it was uh, August of last year uh, as uh, project lead for the firmware. Um, so I, I started working uh, on my own little tweaks to the firmware, um, like like Garth mentioned back in uh, the first year that uh, after Kevin had released it. Um, and, you know, as you're kind of more involved in the community, 
um, you know, people start to take notice and, and like, Hey, you're, you're contributing a lot. You want, you want some increased responsibility here. And so I, I, here, let me give you admin on discourse that you can help <laughs> moderate uh, here. Let me give you a push ability on GitHub. Yes, I'm, I'm familiar with this. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, it kind of organically uh, uh, grew out of that. And, you know, as, as Garth mentioned, you know, uh, Kevin, uh, was a brilliant developer on the project, being able to sort of simultaneously ship the device firmware and uh, the Android app and the Python client. Uh, you know, he was very much one of these uh, these rare 10x developers that people like to <laughs> to to say. But so it's been interesting, kind of democratizing the the efforts. You know, we've gotten such a big uh, community of volunteers now that work on their own little slice, and then. You know, even past that, I would say there's a lot of community efforts that aren't aren't necessarily a part of MeshTastic itself, but build on top of MeshTastic. All right, so let's let's take a step back then, and I've got to ask, what is MeshTastic? I know I know, sort of we we've touched on this, but give us the the overview, the thirty thousand foot view. What what problem exactly is this trying to solve, and what can people do with it today? So. Uh, our, our sort of project tagline is uh, we're an open source, off grid, decentralized mesh network built uh, to run on affordable devices that are low power. So um, essentially, the you know Kevin's sort of uh, initial use case of paragliding was you know there's no once you get to a certain point you you run out of cell infrastructure. So having uh, low power IoT devices that you can pair via uh, Bluetooth uh, to your to your cell phone apps and and in the initial case Android uh, and be able to send text messages and location information. That's kind of the core of uh, what MeshTastic is. And in terms of how it does that, uh, it's utilizing as as Garth mentioned, you know these these T beam devices were sort of the the first. Uh, you know, pilot devices, uh, and they have a LoRa modem. Um, and for those that are not familiar with uh, LoRa technology, it's a it's a radio protocol that essentially um, can operate on license free bands, and it uh, uses spread spectrum technology, and it it offers a ton of range uh, at low bandwidth operation um and low power operation so that's kind of that's kind of the core of, of what mesh tastic does and how uh how it operates and so what what kinds of data are we pushing using mesh tastic is this tcp ip stack uh location data now can we do voice calls over it what's the what's the landscape look like there most of the um most of the messages that you would send with MeshTastic as kind of the core uh, use case of it is uh, text messages, very short text messages like you would imagine SMS, um, uh, position location information. So you can send, uh, you know, for the devices that have GPS or can acquire a location from your uh, your apps, they can send um, their position over the mesh. Um, you, Recently, we added uh, what we call waypoints. So that's sending an ad hoc message where we're where we're saying, "I'm going to drop a pin over here," and and you know have have an icon and a name, so you can you can kind of share share that sort of thing. There's also um, uh, telemetry. So uh, one of the things that I worked on worked on initially getting involved in the project was um, augmenting a lot of our our supported sensors and getting. Things like temperature and barometric pressure, um, you know, any any kind of sort of weather station type data pushed over the mesh. Uh, so, the the main limitation with with uh, uh, the LoRa protocol is, you know, you're dealing with such a small bandwidth, so you have to kind of really optimize things for the wire, and there, you're limited on what you can send over that. Um, there's there's not much room for things like video or voice or or porting a full TCP IP stack to um, over Laura, but uh, yeah. I, 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 you mentioned um, range. Laura is really an, an interesting topic in itself. Um, 
But what, what kind of, I mean, so I'm, I'm, I'm just going through my head into so many scenarios. I'm an old radio guy, but I mean, by old, I mean like two period uh, stuff. And, um, uh, but I'm wondering, you know, so are, are, are you putting, I'm, I'm thinking there's in communities, but shouldn't these also like belong in every car now? Almost. I'm, 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 I'm going that far with it. Like this is an ideal thing to just have, I would imagine. But do you have to have a community involvement? Like you have to know everybody else has got one. There's like four questions at once there. That, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah. So I would say partially we haven't figured out a great uh, global mesh solution. There is there's a lot of radio configuration options and details in order to mesh properly. So basically we have a set of settings and then everybody that shares those same settings could potentially either contribute to each other's mesh network. So they would each have different secrets that they're using, but they're using the same settings. And then those packets can be shared amongst different people chatting distinctly. Um, and then there are some limits to the total number of nodes that could be in any one network. Um, so we we have had a lot of community interest in building kind of larger global networks, and we have um, some instances now where we're getting towards the limits that are set in the in the firmware. They're small microcontrollers, right? So we have an in memory limitation at this point. There's kind of a rolling. 80 device limit. So as your as your device has seen 80 devices, if it sees another one, it'll it'll drop out the last one it saw and add a new one. It's like a it's like a network switch, only being able to store so many MAC addresses. It yeah. totally is. It, we, nah. we we have a structure within the within each device we call the node DB, right? So uh, because it is operating on a mesh network, there is there is an essence of you having to keep track of known nodes what their what their names are uh mac addresses etc and uh that 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 scales only to a certain point and the the other sort of limitation is um because it is a mesh network that is operating on uh a very low bandwidth space um rebroadcasting sort of falls apart past a certain point um you know the, as you scale up the number of nodes um those messages uh getting rebroadcasted with with 80 nodes that may or may not see each other at the at the time that utilizes a lot of airtime so it's uh you know it's it would be nice to have more th support than 80 80 nodes but it really it really does get pretty complex fairly quickly So I know something else Doc was curious about, and he he would ask this if I gave him the chance, I'm sure. Um, but what uh, what is the range? Like, how far have you seen these connections work? Uh, personally, my my limit, which I'm being in in sort of the the hilly Arkansas terrain here, uh, there's not there's not really great line of sight like you might get out west. Um, I've been able to get around 50 miles and that was, that was line of sight. Um, our world record <laughs> mesh tastic, uh, distance, uh, point to point was, uh, a guy in New Zealand got 166 kilometers. Um, and that was just dipole antennas, um, and, and two, two T beam devices, um, nothing nothing special going on there no amplification or anything but not that little stubby antenna right you you've got the little tiny stubby antenna on that tv that thing's not going 160 yeah it yeah it was more like more like this so so uh you know most of the devices within the u.s are operating on the 900 megahertz ism band so um you know a dipole isn't very big on in that case but uh yeah the, i would say one of the first things that uh, if folks want to achieve really good range is throw away the stock antennas. And I think that's, that's probably, <laughs> that's probably true of a lot of, a lot of different radio applications, right? The first thing you upgrade is, is the antenna. Um, so uh, we, we've tried to, we've tried our best in our, our community. And if, if you get in our discord, you'll find a lot of uh, antenna recommendations where folks have really done the, the, 
their due diligence to try to locate well-tuned antennas for for your LoRa band. Yeah, I know with with my little little tiny setup here, you know, this is uh, I think this is the LoRa antenna on this one, and it's not great. Yep. I can get about a block and a half down the road before they stop talking to each other. So one of these days, I will show back up in your Discord and start picking brains about better antenna and antenna placement and all of that. Um, it kind of seems to me, and and I guess this is maybe just my use case thinking about it, but you're not going to see probably a lot of community wide installs. This is going to be more, you know, one, one person wants to track their vehicles or one family wants to be able to have contact or a group of hikers want to be able to talk to each other. And so most of your rollouts is probably what four or five nodes at the max. Um, it gets used. So there's a lot of people with, with off grid properties where they have a, a, section of land that has a hard time getting a cell signal or they have a cell signal at one part of their property and they don't for the rest of the farm. Um, the One of the developers that did some of the initial iOS map work is a farmer in New Zealand. Um, and so he was tracking his quads around the farm mm -hmm. um, and had 10 or 15 nodes tracking his family and workers and things um, managing all the different things that were going on in the farms. Uh, it's been used for some races, like uh, long, long uh, races in like Arizona or desert places. Um, so kind of anywhere where you don't have great cell coverage, uh, it helps to have some height. So, um, you know, like Burning Man has been a use case people have tried, but it's so flat that it, the success has been less good potentially than paragliding or hiking where you have some nodes with a height advantage that can communicate uh -huh. to the other um, parts of the mesh. Um, we just need to mount an antenna on top of whatever sculpture they put out there. Just get it high enough. <laughs> yeah, the car is a really good use case because you get a magnetic antenna, put it on the top of your car, get a yep. big ground plane and um, get a pretty good signal in an automobile to back to a location. I kind of live at the, I live where there are other radio towers within blocks of me. Mm -hmm. um, and so even though I'm in an urban area, I can pretty easily get five or six miles because I have some, some height advantages. I've, I actually got all the way from, all the way from Bellevue to Seattle across the lake, which was about 12 miles. Um, and does not look like it's really line of sight, but, um, it's kind of line of sight once you take out all the trees and buildings and the LoRa technology, which is what's used in a lot of your water meters and uh, gas meters and and this, those smart, those various smart utility items is is pretty good at at getting through. So, I, I'm wondering if uh, the system uses something similar to what happens with cellular telephony, which is in some some ways in similar frequencies uh that are up there well i mean your phone laying on the seat of your car is not in line of sight generally of a cell tower or a cell site a lot of them aren't towers at all they're just like on the side of a building or something but part of it is that it that the cellular system makes use of what used to be a problem with tv and fm radio which is multi-path where you get interference what happens is it the the signal is carried. In other words, the, the throughput goes on multiple channels, as it were, multiple paths. So you don't always have line of sight, but you have a kind of efficiency built in. And the sense and the receivers uh, uh, with cellular anyway, are much more sensitive than than AM and FM radios ever were because it uses digital technology. Is something similar going on? Is that built into Loran or um, I'm in an area where I don't know much. I, I know too much of the old stuff and not enough of the new stuff, but I'm I'm just wondering about how the signal processing works to take advantage of when there isn't line of sight or where, you know, the the signal might degrade a bit, but you can still make sense of it. It degrades pretty quickly, I would say, outside of line of sight. Once you get past certain distance thresholds, um, and it it definitely happens when you're in a, an urban environment um, where you have a lot of, of buildings, right, and you've got. Um, physical physical structures of course laura laura hates um going through the earth more than anything so yeah if you've got a, a large a large hill there 
but uh, I, I can't necessarily speak to its similarities with with cell technology. But I know when Semtech uh, initially developed LoRa, they were sort of competing with a lot of the existing 900 megahertz solutions. So part of the protocol was um, sort of being designed to cut through like GSM interference. Um, So I'm I'm really curious. Uh, does do do we have stored and forward technology here, or is it just blast once and hope everybody hears it? So we do have a store and forward module that is kind of working. Um, it's <laughs> it's been worked on off and on. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, store store and forward does I, I will say work with an asterisk, but it is not enabled by default. So. Uh, the traditional mode is just attempt to rebroadcast uh, the messages, uh, and we do that several times um, if if we don't hear an, an acknowledgement. So uh, the traditional mode within the mesh is to do so I would I would call it a modified naive rebroadcasting uh, or flood flood rebroadcasting because we are rebroadcasting. Um, essentially like regardless of uh whether or not a node heard us just in the attempts to you know there might be more nodes out there that didn't didn't hear um this other nodes rebroadcast um and there's also acknowledgments that take place for each message to, to ensure that that message was delivered and whether or not to give uh the phone a notification that we did not successfully deliver that to any other nodes Okay. And, and that was one of the other things I was going to ask about is in the in the different rooms that someone has set up, whether there's acknowledgement that, hey, this other node has heard this message. You know, you, you think about um, times when you're doing human human to human communication. So miss, missing a single temperature reading, it's not the end of the world. But if mm -hmm. you've tried to send a text message to someone over MeshTastic, and potentially if that's an important message, like, I need help, here's where I'm at it would be really nice to know for sure that the person on the other end has seen it. <laughs> yeah. We, we, uh, in our, in our, uh, protocol, we have kind of an established, um, uh, we call it packet priority, right? So, uh, some messages need to be acknowledged, like you said, and, and others don't, um, can kind of be sent in the background. It's like fire and forget, you know, hope, hopefully somebody heard this <laughs> <laughs> and those still get rebroadcasted. So, so there's still a part of the mesh that there's just not, the additional overhead of acknowledgements because you know acknowledgements are airtime too so mm -hmm. all right now i want to get garth in on this conversation some and we haven't asked him a whole lot but i see that he does the ios work um and i'm curious garth did you pretty much do the ios bring up because this was originally an android it was started by somebody at google so it was on android originally imagine that um was, was ios kind of your baby yeah so that was um I, I'm a .NET developer for work and found that to be sort of unpleasant for open source. So all of the open source stuff that I have done that that was popular, whatever it was, Raspberry Pi or mm -hmm. Ansible scripts, things like that. Um, and so I, for a while, was carrying around an Android phone with my iPhone to make this work while I was hiking and stuff and just got tired of carrying around the Android phone. So I bought a Mac mini and learn Swift UI and the uh, the improvements of Swift UI have mapped pretty nicely with um, working on getting the app figured out. We had some initial, because it was developed only with Android, um, there were some differences between the Bluetooth stacks and what Apple required that took, took a while to sort out. So I worked with Ben a lot on that. And then uh, in November when we launched version two of the firmware, then I launched the app in the app store and been on test flight and we had been uh, working through various bugs and stuff before that. So yeah, I was tired of carrying two phones mostly. <laughs> no, that raises another question. Are there, are there any of these devices that are, you know, on the mesh tastic network that are standalone? And I, I want to say I've seen an image of, you know, kind of a, a PCB with the little tactile key buttons on it. An antenna coming off, and I'm trying to remember if that was a mesh tastic specific device or not. Does something like that exist? 
Yes, that's uh, it's called the Messenger. Um, so our uh, mesh with the uh, uh, M E S H. Clever. And that is a fully standalone device. It use, uses an I squared C keyboard um, and the OLED screen, and then uh, the developer of the mesh ta- or the messenger device worked with a firmware developer in Germany to set up some additional notifications. So he's got like an LED light and a vibra motor and stuff in the device so that the um, uh, a light will show up until you dismiss it, showing that there's new messages received. And then we're also working on uh, enhancing the on-screen um, display of your message history and some of that stuff, which is not totally complete. Right now you can kind of see a message when it comes in and you can type your own message, but the, a lot of the, yeah, there's the, there's the device picture. I see it scrolling by there. So, <laughs> um, and then we also support using just a rotary encoder to do like canned messages. So if you've used like a Garmin in reach where you can have, I think they have like three preset messages that you can edit in the cloud and then five or six built in. I'm headed home, send an emergency, whatever. Mm-hmm type of stuff and you can use a rotary encoder to dial through. Yeah, Ben's got one there. Um, oh yeah. To you know twist That's through cool. the set messages and send that. Uh so having having some standalone devices is definitely a use case that people have. You can get a lot longer battery life. So these devices that like that are based off the NRF fifty two, which is what's in that rack that you have there. Um that's really a long life, low power device with a that can last for weeks at a time on a single battery charge. So, um, emergencies or or backpacking or places where you don't have much power, that's a great way to go. <laughs> so that I have we have queuing up questions in the background here, and but first I have to let everybody know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. That's Collide with a K. Collide is a device trust solution that ensures unsecured devices can't access your apps. Collide has some big news. If you're an Okta user, Collide can get your entire fleet up to 100% of compliance. Collide patches one of the major holes in zero trust architecture. That's device compliance. Think about it, your identity provider only lets known devices log into apps, but just because a device is known doesn't mean it's in a secure state. In fact, plenty of the devices in your fleet probably shouldn't be trusted. Maybe they're running an out-of-date OS version, or maybe they've got unencrypted credentials lying around. If a device isn't compliant or isn't running the Collide agent, it can't access the organization's SaaS apps or other resources. The device user can't log into your company's cloud apps until they fix the problem on their end. It's that simple. For example, a device will be blocked if an employee doesn't have an up-to-date browser. Using end user remediation helps drive your fleet to 100% compliance without overwhelming your IT team. Without Collide, IT teams have no way to solve these compliance issues or to stop insecure devices from logging in. With Collide, you can set and enforce compliance across your entire fleet, Mac, Windows, and Linux. Collide is unique in that it makes device compliance part of the authentication process. When a user logs in, with Okta, Collide alerts them to compliance issues and prevents unsecured devices from logging in. It's security you can feel good about because Collide puts transparency and respect for users at the center of their product. To sum it up, Collide's method means fewer support tickets, less frustration, and most importantly, 100% fleet compliance. Visit collide.com floss to learn more or book a demo. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash floss. So guys, I, I'm sitting here as we're talking and imagining all kinds of possible uses. Um, and we, the word community is kind of very broad. But one of them that just jumps into my mind is military. Uh, is there is there a military use that you know of? I suppose being open source, they could just kind of roll their own and you never learn about it. But is is there a military is there a military profile here? 
So one of the sort of the community efforts is to integrate with uh, the ATAC application that was recently opened up by uh, the U.S. Department of Defense, and it runs on Android phones. And so one of our community members um, developed a, what, a plugin that's called the ATAC Forwarder. And the ATAC platform is essentially like a it's like a big blue force tracking sort of uh, application that has a ton of of different bells and whistles that most people will never use. But uh, one of the main use cases is just tracking, tracking folks, sending um, messages out to uh, teams and, and units within a team. And so somebody, you know, found that Meshtastic would be a pretty good transport layer for um for making sort of an infrastructureless TAC ecosystem. And so that's kind of where the the ATAC forwarder plugin uh, came into play. Um, and, and I would say even even outside of the the ATAC ecosystem, yeah, it, it totally makes sense as a, as a use case for for tracking folks um, on on some kind of military operation. Um, certainly like search and rescue um, is is kind of a big big one because you know you think about the the conditions and and being uh outside of cell service completely uh in search and rescue and, and some of those remote locations um something like meshtastic completely uh fits that profile of being able to um, keep up communications particularly location um information to be able to track uh folks as they're setting up grid squares it's funny. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to spell ATAC. <laughs> Jonathan just said something, A-T-A-K, and it wants to correct that. <laughs> the, the, the browser wants to make it something else. So what is the correct spelling there? It's just a, A-T-A-K. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I, th- I think there's multiple versions of ATAC, and I think the, yeah, yeah, there it is, ATAC forwarder. Um, but but one of them was sort of uh, opened up to the public as and they call it like Android Tactical Awareness Kit, I think, is is what it what it stands for. And it's, you, you know, the government kind of opened this up to be utilized by, you know, first responders, uh, search and rescue groups, um, those sorts of, of applications, because they recognize that it was it was a powerful tool to be um you know, used by more than just military applications. I mean, generally what happens with a, with a technology like this, that's has potentially as endless broad applications, a few single kinds of use, like, like we just mentioned the military or search and rescue show up, but I'm, I'm wondering, um, I mean, if you, if you did a pie chart of all the different uses right now that are going on with, Meshtastic and LoRa, for that matter, as well. Um, what does that look like? What's the biggest? Way, or is it just all of the slices are so small it's pretty hard to generalize? Um, so I think there's probably like probably like a third of the usage is sort of hiking and outdoors stuff of some kind. Um, then the the, the military search and rescue slash people playing airsoft, um, you, you know, which is all kind of a, a similar batch of things using using tax server is probably 10, 20 percent. And then there's just all sorts of of other use cases where there are communities that, you know, where where cell service is hard for whatever reason. Um, is kind of the rest of the use cases people use um like you mentioned laura wan earlier which is kind of the, we use laura but laura wan is a is a separate um very organized set of data that is used mostly for like agriculture sensors and the uh water meters and stuff and we use the the p2p laura which is kind of like just device to device um, so we're not doing these massive sensor uh, groups, but rather these smaller batches of devices that can work together. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that there's a single use case that's been way more than all the others. The outdoor use case is definitely the the main one. Emergency preparedness. Um, you know, Canada had a, had their main cell provider go down. 
and we had an increase in Canadian users interested in a way to communicate um, if once again, the cell provider went down for a week, right? And so then, so that also people come up with a use case as they are um, affected by something, you know, we had people in Iowa that were affected by, I think it was called a derecha, some sort of land hurricane. Didn't sound very fun. Um, but they, there was a community there that worked to set up a network so that they had a, you know, a, a node on a taller building and they had some way to communicate where to go charge your cell phones and things because they'd had a year earlier, um, an emergency that, that they kind of hadn't had good communications for. So, um, kind of a, a way to fix problems in cell connectivity, um, you know, lower cost, uh, small sensor networks. So, you know, you might build a, a LoRaWAN is a great way to build a thousand sensor network if you have that many, but if you have a much smaller network that can be cost prohibitive where you could build up a bunch of individual community nodes for air quality or, or temperature, that kind of thing. Um, so a lot of different use cases and uh, a lot of what we've done over the last year is try to get ready to accept more of these use cases because the firmware spends a lot of time uh, managing the mesh. And so we've created some serial modules and things that allow people to hook their own devices and sensors and stuff into the mesh and start using it for whatever ideas they come up with for their own sensor networks or a piece of data they want to get from a long way away to um, where they're at. So. So I want to I want to ask about something, and there, there's a term here that I think may be a little overloaded, and that is modules. Um, when we're talking about modules, are we talking about hardware or little blocks of software? In this case, it would be little blocks of software, but there there <laughs> there are there are hardware modules as well, right within some of the. Um, some of like the rack wireless options, like you installed the, the look like you had the GPS module on, on your, your rack wireless device. But, uh, we, we have sort of a module architecture in, in terms of the, the firmware, uh, where, uh, bits of, of code are sort of plugged into the, the pipeline to, to interact with devices or, um, or peripherals. So we've got like, as Garth mentioned, the serial module. So, so that gives, that gives the user a uh, the ability to um, send stuff over the mesh or receive stuff through the mesh with a UART interface. Um, and there's also, you know, the telemetry module, as I mentioned earlier, um, is for interacting with sensors uh, that you might install over um, the I squared C bus of a device. Um, canned messages modules another popular one that's that's the one that enables the the messenger device to to be able to um free type and and scroll through your your list of of we call them canned messages um that you can pre-program your device to to have as a standalone unit and and fire off over the mesh as a text yeah, so that's uh, that's interesting. As you were as you were talking about some of the use cases, I actually I was thinking very much about last night. Uh, I think we mentioned this at the very top of the show, but the power here went off for about four hours last night, and we've done a few things. Uh, obviously, we're we're kind of in flyover country, and so we get tornadoes here, and we've done a few things to try to be prepped for that. And one of the things that was just great to have was this little cheap candle lantern. They're like 20 bucks and they make these nine hour candles. And when the power went off, I just went and lit that and was able to hang it up in the middle of a room and we had just enough light to see. And, you know, you go through something like that and it is a, it's kind of a great test for, are you prepared enough for when the power goes out? What, what have you done that's going to work well? What have you done that's not going to work very well? And I'm kind of thinking about that with, with Meshtastic here, because like you say, every once in a while, the cell phones do stop working for whatever reason, um, whether it's because of a weather event or a, a, a bug, you know, somebody tripped over the cable in the data center. And it really seems to me that there's going to be, and maybe there already has been, 
but there's going to be some disaster of some sort and there's going to be somebody that has a mesh tastic node grid already set up and ready to go and really going to be able to be the heroes because of it has that happened yet or have you guys been just responding when things happen you know i i would i'll i'll kind of take this one because and, and you might remember this jv because you're 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 not too far uh from my neck of the woods in, in Arkansas, but we had an EF3 tornado that rolled mm -hmm. through Little Rock recently, and it actually knocked down a cell tower. And, uh, you know, that that tended to degrade performance uh, uh, with folks' uh, mobile data operations in that part of town. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't bad enough to need mesh tastic yet, but I, but it, it it certainly got me kind of mobilized to mm -hmm. man, I really need to 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 get this thing uh you know set up to where we can have have uh emergency communications because it it is it, it's frustrating to to not have um your cell phone working and be able to to get into contact with people and know know where folks are and two two way radios only go only work so well um and not everybody is a is an amateur radio enthusiast so this, you know, I, I I see a really good space for mesh tastic and kind of uh, prepared emergency preparedness for for folks that do live in areas that are prone to um, disasters like this. Yeah, um, we actually have a question from the chat room that's really interesting, and I want to get this in. It's from Gumby uh, in our IRC chat room. He says, "Don't you run afoul of FCC regulations if you start homebrewing antenna plus radio configurations?" You can, uh, is the short answer. If, if you exceed the, um, so the, the FCC, and I can't remember if it's part 90, it's, it's one of those FCC part numbers <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, where they, they regulate, um, the ISM band. So your, 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 uh, 900 megahertz, your 2.4 gigahertz, and I think 5.8, right? Uh, there, there are limitations. Um, we do our best in the firmware to, um, uh, part of the reason why we have uh, what we call lawyer regions is to, to, to do our due diligence to make sure that people don't violate their particular country's ISM band limitations. Mm -hmm. Um, the only way that you can unlock and, and sort of get the, uh, the radio God mode, uh, keys to the kingdom where you can start modifying your, your transmit power is uh through uh licensed operation we, we call it ham mode where you can define your frequency um override duty cycles set your um your transmit power to above what what your country might allow with ism band usage um here in the us that uh 900 megahertz would fall under the 33 centimeter band if i'm not mistaken in ham and you get you get a just ludicrous amount of transmit power from the FCC. They give you like 1500 Watts or something. I, yeah. I can't remember the specific figure. I, I haven't seen a 1500 watt <laughs> mesh testing device. <laughs> if somebody wants to do a moon bounce, uh, that's, <laughs> that's on the table. Yeah, that's great. So but when, when, when you go ham mode though, there's this, there's this little quirk with amateur radio in the United States. Um, and this is kind of a pet peeve of mine. I am amateur licensed, but one of the reasons that I don't use it very much is because there's a restriction that you cannot use encryption. And there are some differences of understanding of exactly what this means. But it's real dicey to use encryption with amateur radio license. And that probably means that you, you have to run everything in the clear with Meshtastic once you go ham mode, doesn't it? That that's correct. So we actually we drop encryption, and that's something I failed to mention earlier. Is that um, when when you start at your mesh in Mesh Tastic by default, since we are on the the ISM band, and you you can run encryption, we actually run uh, AES two fifty six bit encrypted payloads by default. So there's a there's a fair bit of privacy that you get um, out of the box, um, but when you enable licensed operations, we we drop the encryption from the payload. So they're they're transmitted in clear text. They're still encoded in the mesh tastic scheme, but they're they're not encrypted. So anybody else on that frequency would be able to um to see that to see those payloads. We also um transmit what we call the node info, um, which is is sort of the the announcement of like th this is 
this is a node on the mesh, you know, here's my ID, here's my name, everything. We, uh, we actually set that to your, um, your call sign, um, your ham radio call sign and transmit that every 10 minutes in order to, to be compliant with the, uh, the regulation. So we, we've worked hard to try to really, <laughs> really be as legal as possible. You know, as you know, somebody can set up a, a crazy Yagi antenna and a, and a, uh, and an amplifier and of course, mm-hmm. you know, violate the heck out of the FCC, but that's, <laughs> I can't control that. <laughs> well, and that's kind of a dangerous because there are hams out there who their, their goal in life, their hobby is finding people that do stuff like that. And it's, it's not real hard to figure out where radio signals are coming from, actually. <laughs> it's a whole game. Of let's, let's, let's find the transmitter that's breaking the rules. Uh, all right. I, I do want to ask one of the other modules that I've seen that I've heard a little something about is uh, apparently there is an audio module. And this kind of uh, this kind of blows my mind because I know the hardware that you guys are running on. What's what's the story with the audio module? Uh, one of our German uh, firmware developers actually uh, pioneered that. And I have not I, I confess I haven't played with it yet, but that operates on the uh, 2.4 gigahertz. Um, only LoRa modems because those offer more bandwidth. And the the way that that one operates is it uses um, very highly compressed uh, Codec 2 algorithm encoded audio. So some some ham radio guys might be familiar with that. There's a there's a um, there's a ham radio uh, protocol that's that's kind of uh, been developed over the past few years called M17 project that that utilizes that as well. And it's supposedly like one of the best um, voice compression codecs. So, you know, because LoRa is, is so um, low bandwidth, even on the higher bandwidth 2.4 gigahertz spectrum modems, uh, we, we're really trying to cram as much as we can. So, so you're getting essentially a short voice message that's encoded and then reassembled on, on the other side. Um, but it's uh that one's still very fresh so uh you're you're kind of you know here there be dragons so uh you're on your own um playing with that particular one but but it's really exciting yeah it sounds it sounds pretty interesting and i could see some future there okay one of the last questions we're we're getting towards the bottom of of our time one of the last questions i want to ask though is and i ask this because i don't see it in the documentation anywhere what is the recommended way to get started with Meshtastic? Like, what is the beginner-friendly hardware to go out and buy? Um, so there's there's a bunch of, of sort of devices that people, community members and such, are selling on Etsy that are completed. I'd say for a handset, anything that has the NRF52 is a good choice because it has the best battery life. Uh, the T-Beam is, if you just want to get two devices and pop batteries in them and go out and start doing some range testing, which is, I think, probably the best way to start, right, is to get two things and see how it works in some locations where you have communications issues to solve, right? Um, and those will, those devices are useful and then you can make all sorts of different radios, right? To do different use cases or to be a repeater that sits on a hill and has a bigger antenna and, um, you know, is kind of the central hub of your network. So it, it depends on your use case a little bit. Uh, but I think getting, getting a couple of devices, um, and just doing a little phone to phone testing to see how things work is probably the best way to get started. Uh, the LoRa technology is pretty good. So I know when I started, I, like a lot of these things, sat down, uh, ordered myself like seven or eight different devices and found for the like two by five mile area I was trying to cover that I really needed like three devices. So, um, you know, get a couple and test out how it actually works in the, in the areas where you, you'll be using it. All right. Very cool. And then I've got to ask before we let you go, what is the weirdest or most unusual, most creative use case that you've seen somebody use Meshtastic for?
either of you can take it. Whoever has a, whoever has a good story. Uh, so we're seeing more music festival stuff, which has been interesting because the hardware devices are then adding features that are kind of new, like LEDs flashing and stuff for to to be a part of. You know, it's kind of a combination device communication where there's bad cell service. Uh, and then also being a light for the electronic music festival and some of that. So that's been kind of interesting. And then, uh, a couple of our bigger networks are in Ukraine. So, um, that's been kind of an interesting, um, Mm -hmm. use case. And we've had a lot of growth in Europe, I think because of, you know, being a war in Europe for the first time in a long time has, has created some of those same, um, off grid and emergency preparedness and stuff, uh, types of use cases in the last couple of years. So I'm curious because I have family members who climb. Do you have people climbing mountains that use it? Is that, is that, a, or is that just more gear that you just don't want because you want to travel light? I have no idea. You know, the satellite stuff is pretty good at this point. So if you're a mountaineer, yeah. I think you probably have a Garmin inReach device or you're using the iPhone satellite connected piece, you know, for that, you're not taking any chances. Um, a lot of people hiking, you know, not, not at 8,000 feet and above are, are probably where most of our uses are at at this point. Yeah. It, it's, I, it's, so you're talking about it is the, uh, the geographic distribution of use, is it concentrated in Europe or is it just sort of like began in Europe and is spread elsewhere? You mentioned New Zealand was, and farmers there. Um, I'm sort of thinking about how communities form and what, what they're, they're about still for the. Yeah, so New Zealand is obviously a bunch of little islands and water. So they have kind of the perfect Laura line of sight, right? The record is set from the top of the mountain to a boat. Um, mm-hmm. And so like there's no better there's no better radio signal than the top of a mountain to a boat you could see over water. Um, so the, the U S is probably 75% and then the rest of the world is probably 25 with 20% of that being Europe and half of that being probably Germany. Um, it's very popular in Germany for whatever reason we have, uh, one of our main firmware developers is there. So I know he has done some promotion and we've been featured there some. So in the last year, we've had a lot of European growth. Yeah. So if, if somebody listening to this for the first time, not knowing anything about us, they'd go first to the Meshtastic site or go to your GitHub or both, or what, what's the best way to jump in? I would say um, the, the website's a good place to start, but I would encourage people to go straight into the discord as well because that's there's so much uh, involvement in that discord it's very very helpful people there um and and just a lot of involvement with the community in general um i think that's one of the things that's kind of pushed the project forward more than anything is just getting getting folks in there where they can have conversations and and i'm i'm thinking too because we had uh some people from the ham world on recently um uh levi maya from santa barbara in particular um are what's the appeal to the hams that are out there because i know we have some that are listening here just like add this to your portfolio of gear that you can uh work with or i'm looking for what the van is between the hams and and uh and you guys yeah i would say it you know a good way to think of mesh tastic is kind of a modern a, a more modern extensible uh, version of, of what APRS is, um, you know, you've, you've obviously got the, the location component, you've got text, um, with your, with your ham, you know, radio license, you've got a lot of power at your disposal on the 70 centimeter band or the 33 centimeter band. Um, and Laura is just a resilient, signal so if you can if you can put a uh, a mesh tastic node on a ham tower and and amplify it i'm i'm pretty convinced you'll get some some exceptional range that might even uh eclipse uh you know a traditional aprs station i, I know a bunch of guys that like to you know their goal in life is to put repeaters on mountains 
you know, and especially here in Southern California, where you can walk to the top of a lot of them. And uh, I don't know, I guess if you're running some off of solar with a battery, that would be kind of cool. Yeah, because you're not sucking a, a lot of power off the grid. Uh, there are more questions queued up, but we're pretty much at the end of the show. So but we always end with the questions we ask, um, ask our guests. What are your favorite text editor and scripting language? Oh, I'm going to I'm going to upset people and say VS Code. It's it's gotten so good. <laughs> <laughs> OK, VS Codium. Fine. No, <laughs> that's better. <laughs> I remember, I'm a .NET developer by day, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and script scripting language. Um, Power no, not power. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> that's another one. <laughs> uh, I would say probably you know JavaScript, TypeScript, just because I have so much of a experience with it. But I've done Python and Ruby and all all the. <laughs> <laughs> I like strongly typed languages. I like TypeScript, C sharp. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I I really don't use a single IDE anymore because it seems like, especially doing well, I don't have much choice. I have to use Xcode for the Apple stuff, which works pretty well, and I have to use VS Code. It works some. Um, I've done, I don't know, probably mostly Python and Bash for scripting stuff, and then whatever <laughs> cloud things need. Uh. Well, this has been great, guys. I, I, I'm looking forward to finding out how well people are responding to this because I think it's a really extremely interesting territory at the at the leading edge of open source development. So, great having you guys on. Thanks for having us. It was fun. Yeah, great to be here. So, Jonathan, that <laughs> that was good. Good stuff. Yeah, um, and you've I got one. That's cool. I do. I have two Already. of them, actually. And like I said, I, I have one sitting at my desk and I've put one hanging off my cell phone and went driving down the street and discovered very quickly that I did not have nearly enough range for it to be particularly useful. So one of, one of my to do list items is figuring out what I need to do as far as getting a, a bigger antenna that, you know, ideally I can hoist one up on top of the house, maybe put a magnetic base one on each of the cars and uh, and then hang a couple off of cell phones, have a little five device mesh that I can go a little bit further out with and be able to report location and all of that stuff. Cause I think that could be useful in some particular situations, but it, it's just cool. It's, it's a neat project. And, uh, you know, it's, it's cool to see guys out there working on something like this and people picking it up and using it. And I'm, I'm really interested to see kind of what comes next. For them as they continue working on things, uh, maybe work out some of those problems or I say problems, challenges with doing store and forward and bigger meshes and just some of the some of the things that you look at and you think, man, it, it could be really useful um, if you could work some of these out and then get more people on board with it. I think it'd be neat. It's uh it's it's funny when my um when my wife took a look at the internet for the first time in 1995 when uh, it came into our house. Uh, and everybody's talking about this, the World Wide Web. And she said, the sweet spot of this thing is local. And and then uh, just the other day, she said the same thing, a similar thing about uh, AI, because AI is like eating, eating the world right now. She said, the sweet spot there is actually personal, it's not corporate. And, you know, I want one for my house. Um, and I, 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 I sense with this that this is really the very beginning of something that can something's going to take off in a big way where it becomes a household word that's a thought that i have i don't know if it happens or not but um i think there's a, a real potential there yeah and there are some other things similar to this and we should have asked them about and we didn't um i believe it's called the helium network is actually laura plus blockchain and uh, so if we have them back again, we definitely need to get their thoughts on that and how that works with Mesh-tastic, if there's any kind of Venn diagram crossover there. I was, I was thinking, you could weigh down anything with blockchain. <laughs> 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 there's a pull quote for you. <laughs> Somewhere. You can take any good idea and ruin it by it. <laughs> right, just, yeah, put that on the book. Put your family on the blockchain. You know? 
<laughs> oh. <laughs> it was great. So what do you what do you have to plug this week? Uh, oh, sure. So um, my main thing, of course, is over at Hackaday. I do the security column uh, every Friday. It goes live Friday morning. I have a lot of fun there covering the things going on in the news. And then I do the occasional other odd story. Um, probably, oh goodness, I don't remember if I've written Mesh Tastic up for Hackaday yet or not. But if I haven't, I'm sure I will at some point. Uh, and then there's some other things that, that we go on there. And then the other thing to mention is the Untitled Linux Show, which is a, a lot of fun. We go live with that on Saturday afternoons. And that is a Club Twit exclusive show. So we record it over on Discord. Discord. You've got to be a member of Club Twit to uh, to get a hold of it. Of course, ad free. Uh, and if you're not on Club Twit, it's only seven dollars a month, and you get ad free access to all of the shows. Why aren't you on Club Twit? Uh, <laughs> but anyway, we we really have a lot of fun with the Untitled Linux Show, keeping keeping track with Linux development and applications, some how tos, lots of fun there. And uh, you know, we'd love to see folks join us. <laughs> That's great. I'm looking at the back channel here. <laughs> anyway, so. All right, this has been great. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everybody. Um, next week, and I have to bring the thing up again. I'm always not quite ready. And this week, I made sure I was ready. And now I can't find the part where the thing is on my thing. Oh, gosh. Um, all right. Scroll down. Oh. And next, I guess next week. Oh, why they, I can't make the spreadsheet work. So next week, you do it, Jonathan. Jump, sure. That... So next week, we've got Dan Middleton of the That's Confidential right. Computing Consortium. Uh, and then we do want to let folks know we're going to be running about an hour and a half early next week because we're right. preempted by a, a Google event that Twit is going to cover. So come whatever an hour and a half early happens to be in your particular time zone. Uh, here in Central Time, it's going to be about 10 o'clock in the morning, I think. Uh, so that's 8 a.m. Uh, Twit time. Yeah, on the east and, coast. and for me too. I'm I'm on the west coast right now. It's going to yes. be eight a.m. Well, yeah. that sure to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, but that's great. Thanks for catching me on that. I was so prepared I couldn't do it. That, that there it goes. And what can I say? All right. Thanks everybody. We will see you next week. You're welcome. <laughs> Hey, I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and each week I join with my co-host to bring you This Week in Space, the latest and greatest news from the final frontier. We talk to NASA chiefs, space scientists, engineers, educators, and artists, and sometimes we just shoot the breeze over what's hot and what's not in space books and TV. And we do it all for you, our fellow true believers. So whether you're an armchair adventurer or waiting for your turn to grab a slot in Elon's Mars rocket, join us on This Week in Space and be part of the greatest adventure of all time.